Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Ann Fibbs, Director of Education in the Office for Equity and Diversity. And welcome to Bisexuality and Beyond, Reimagining Sexual Orientation, the second of the seven conversations that make up the Office for Equity and Diversity's Critical Conversations about Diversity and Justice series. The Critical Conversation series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries. Jody Gray from the Libraries, who's sitting in the back, is responsible for creating a list of further academic resources on each of our Critical Conversations topics, which you can link to on our webpage. This is our third year of offering these conversations, and we're excited to continue offering live streaming so that you can watch via our website in real time or at a later date, since they will be archived on our Critical Conversations webpage. I just had someone ask me, um, the second year, all seven conversations are archived. So if you're interested in those, you can click on a link that says, go to the 2013-2014 conversations, and you'll be able to view all of those. We've also added an opportunity for you to provide feedback on this series. If you signed in, hopefully you did, we'll email you a link to an online evaluation, or you can access that link also on the Critical Conversations webpage. And as with all of the conversations, we'll start with some discussion among our panelists and our moderator, and then move to Q&A in the audience. For today's conversation, I'm con excited to introduce one of our own in the Office for Equity and Diversity, uh, Frankie Jader, who will be our moderator, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Frankie. Frankie serves as the office manager for the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender Ally Programs Office here at the University of Minnesota. She holds an Associate of Arts from North Hennepin Community College and a Bachelor's of Arts in Diversity Education and Identity Studies at Metropolitan State University. She currently sits on the board of the Jean Nicholas Treader Collection, which is an LGBT archive, and I would be remiss if I didn't say it was in this very building. <laughs> and Lisa Vicoli, who's the curator, is back there. And um, if you like a tour, I'm sure Frankie and Lisa would love for you to do that, so contact one of them. Uh, is the facilitator of the GLBTA mentor program here on campus and co-chairs the network, an LGBTQ affinity group for higher education employees across the Twin Cities. As if that isn't enough, she's been, Frankie has created and implemented hundreds of diversity trainings in higher education institutions and businesses, including the University of St. Thomas, Metropolitan State University, Gustavus Adolphus College, the United States Department of Agriculture, Minnesota College Personnel Association, and Transformation House, which is a sober living facility. All of her trainings focus on the intersections of race, faith, ability, status, sexuality, gender, and socioeconomic status. She's active with many community organizations, including the Minneapolis College Personnel Association, or MCPA, and the Twin Cities Good Time Softball League. She's a book addict. She can outcraft Martha Stewart, which I think is pretty impressive, <laughs> any day of the week. And in the summer, you'll find her on, the, her on the softball field with her team, the Hero Squad. I think we're fortunate to have Frankie Jader. Please welcome her. Thank you so much, Anne. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, in my role in the office, a lot of what I do is behind the scenes work, and so it's so nice to be able to have an opportunity to facilitate um, outside of that spectrum and to be a part of something like this. So I'm very honored and grateful for the opportunity to do that. Um, so I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, some ground rules that we have and just some um, expectations and info for you, and then I'd like to have the panelists introduce themselves. And like Ann mentioned, we're going to um, uh, answer two preset questions that I'm going to ask all of the panelists to answer, and then after that we'll do a Q&A with you all. Um, so um, the first thing, please minimize distractions and be present in this space. So um, turning off cell phones or putting them on vibrate, um, it's completely understandable if you need to take a call or a text, um, but we ask that you leave the room to do that um, and respect the time that the panelists have taken as well as the other audience members to be here. Um, the panelists are speaking on behalf of themselves um, and their own lived experiences. Um, and they're not necessarily representing their departments, organizations, um, or the entire bipan fluid queer community. <laughs> While we're all experts in our own lived experiences, we're going to stick to that arena um, and not, you know, be representatives of all folks. And while a lot of those um, 
perspectives may probably align with the departments and orgs that we're doing. Please keep in mind that these are our own lived experiences. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to say that um, panelists absolutely reserve the right to pass on a question um, if they don't feel like they have an answer or if personally um, they would prefer to abstain, then um, we're going to respect that wish of theirs and then we'll move forward. Sound good? Nice. All right. So panelists, for the first question that I have for you is how do you think society is how do you think society's binary categorization of straight and gay identities impacts the bi, pan, fluid, and queer community? What are the ramifications, and how do we as a movement go forward? And if you all want to do popcorn style, oh, I totally screwed up. <laughs> Oh, man. See? Okay. So one more thing. Let's exercise giving grace so when we make mistakes in front of a whole audience of people, we can move forward from that. <laughs> All right. So how about we backtrack and I actually let people know who you are and then we can move forward. Does that sound okay? All right. Can we start with you, Meg? Is that cool? Can you hear me okay? Is that working? Great. Okay. Um, so my name's Meg John Barker, and you can probably tell from my accent I'm not from around here. <laughs> so I'm over from London um, visiting Alex this week. So it was really uh, lucky timing that I got to be part of this panel, which is fantastic. Um, my preferred pronouns is they and them. Um, I had the Buy UK organization in the UK. Um, so that's kind of the big um, organization that brings together bisexuality research and academic work with activism and community. Um, and we produced something called the Bisexuality Report, which is a freely available as a PDF online if you're interested. It's kind of an overview of everything we know from the kind of research literature about bisexuality, plus a load of guidelines. So it's kind of useful in the UK, but I think some people have found it useful internationally as well. Um, we also started the Bi Recon event in the UK, um, which has been going since 2008, and we had an international one in 2010. And again, that's about bringing research and academic stuff together with activism and community. Um, and uh, Lauren and Alex last year um, put on the first American Bi Recon event right here. So, and I was able to come across for that, which was great. Um, so yeah, so by UK we have a website, we uh, produce research guidelines as well for people studying bisexuality. Um, and then other than that, I work at the Open University, which is an online university in the UK. Um, and I'm a lecturer in psychology there, but I'm also a therapist working with gender and sexually diverse people. And the main thing I do really is writing. That's what I enjoy the most. So I've written a kind of self-help book about relationships. And I've also written some guidelines for practitioners working with gender and sexually diverse people. So I can tell people about those if they're interested. Um, <clears throat> hi, I'm Alex and Tafti. My preferred pronouns are either he, him, or they, them. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Minnesota in the program in human sexuality, and I'm both a therapist and a researcher. I'm also a, a bi and trans-identified person, and um, I've been involved with bi community for nearly 15 years, uh, both as an activist and as, a, as an academic as well, starting in the UK and then coming across to the US. I'm also the... A chair for the Bisexual Organizing Project Research Committee, and um, um, which is kind of uh, just starting and trying to figure out how to kind of really bridge that gap between community and kind of academia, which sometimes feels really far apart and um, I personally don't think should be so far apart, which is why we were thrilled to, br to bring BiRecon US um, to the US last year. And I'm really thrilled to be here. My name is Sol Ross Asante. Uh, don't like introductions, so mine's going to be really short. Um, I'm an artist. I work with youth and have been a part of the queer community in many different aspects and facets through seven years, oh, seven, eight years. Hi, my name is Chong, as in Chi Chen Chong, just so you don't get confused. Um, Anyways, I started my activism work about five years ago, my coming out process. Um, I started volunteering for Shades of Yellow, also known as Soy. Um, and then from there, got really involved heavy with um, other community work, um, CAR, Community Action Against Racism, PAVE, Pan-Asian Voices for Equity, um, Don't Buy Miss Saigon Coalition. 
So been, um, it's been a great journey um, growing, and, and most recently, my last um, year's dedication has been around gender equity and gender justice. So working with a handful of local girls' groups um, to discuss um, gender, um, race, uh, sexuality, and um, kind of the impact that g young girls have in our community. Um, beyond that, I am a mom of a two-and-a-half-year-old, so that's been really fun, um, and kind of uh, starting some conversations around family, and uh, queer parenting. Thank you so much for the introductions. Again, my apologies on trying to leap light years forward in that. <laughs> All right, so our first question, which I will go over again. Um, how do you think society's binary categorization of straight gay identities uh, impacts the bipan fluid and queer community? What are some of these ramifications, and how do we, as a movement, go forward? Do you want us to just first? Sure, absolutely. I'm going to say something, and then hopefully you're all going to say something. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, it's a really complex question, <laughs> which is why I've got it written down. Um, I think that any binary categorization kind of closed down possibilities. So when I think about kind of polarities or binaries, it's about what's getting closed down rather than being opened up. And I think that's kind of uh, polarizing straight and gay identities and kind of monosexualities really kind of close down a lot of um, possibilities for people's experiences and for people's identities and kind of really marginalize people who don't fit neatly into those categories. And in terms of the ramifications, I think they are probably more than I can think about right now, but some of the ramifications um, we are starting to see through research, for example, the impact on mental health of bipan fluid kind of uh, folks, um, as well as other folks, you know, it's all about the intersection of like who gets impacted and often like the most marginalized, the most impacted. So um, mental health in bi communities is usually not really great overall. Um, there's uh, also um, substance use sometimes is kind of higher. All the kind of things that we see in marginalized communities again and again, it's the impact of stigma, um, the impact of erasure. You know, if you can see yourself and there is no possibility for you to exist, how do you make sense of a world that doesn't create a possibility for you to be in that world and to have relationships? Um, I think it also has an impact on our ability to relate to each other, either in partnerships or with in community, I think it closes down opportunities for um, you know collaboration across identities, but also um, a lot of bi folks are often in mixed orientations relationships or partnerships, uh, and that can be really challenging because you 're really trying to negotiate um, some uh, pretty major differences and it impacts our ability to to parent as well you know you mentioned parenting and i 'm a parent as well and and so um, how does that impact? Um, kind of our ability to relate to each other. Uh, and I'll let other people say something about moving forward. I don't know who wants to jump in. Oh, I think that, oh, hello. Um, I think that from five years ago to now, there's there's been major progress. So that's something that I'm extremely excited and happy about. Um, I think um, in my own experience, um, in the small conservative town that I had grown up in, Cheesehead Country, Green Bay, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, I knew three Hmong gay men and one Hmong lesbian woman, but I did not know any other bisexuals. And so I just assumed that my identity wasn't um, real and that I was somehow confused. Um, and because I didn't uh, fit in any anywhere, uh, any, any community, that it, it was um, uh, not a reality. But um, I think that things are changing. Um, even in my own uh, being visible, being out, being very loud, um, identifying um, that I am bisexual, naming my sexuality in very public spaces um, has been uh, a huge step in bringing visibility to other folks who have been in my shoes. Um, so I think that's, that's amazing. Um, but I have to say, you know, from five years ago uh, when I first came out, it was really challenging, even in my own community, the Hmong LGBTQ community, um, having been told that I was experimenting, um, that I was confused, 
and um, there was still a lot of biphobia and, and hostility, but I think that things are changing, and I think that the word queer seems to be like a safe place for a lot of folks um, that I've, I've worked with. Um, and in my coming out and um, being very, very visible, um, folks have come to me and said, I identify similar to you, however, I'm too afraid to come out as bi. So I will choose to um, identify as either lesbian or gay um, for the safety of my network, of my uh, social group, of, of belonging in my community. And so I think things are changing. Um, I think even in the last two years from the marriage amendment to now, I think we've made huge strides. Um, well, yeah, everything's been said a little bit. Um, but I, I guess I would like to answer the moving forward question, right? Because there's always this question of how do we move forward from here? How do we progress? Um, and I feel like the answer to, I mean, you can fill in the blank of whatever cause, whether we're talking about transphobia, whether we're talking about spectrums, gender, whatever. Um, most of the time, the way that we move forward is to do our own inner work, right? Um, and inner work looks like a lot of things, right? It looks like education. It looks like action. Um, it looks like conversations like this and interpersonal conversations that you have with your own group, uh, which is important, right? A lot of us are kind of like afraid to bring up things that we might think sound random, like, hey, how about those bi people, right? <laughs> Aren't they uh, interesting? Aren't they just great? But, you know, um, <laughs> It, it, but in our heads, like, that's what we think it has to sound like. We think it has to sound like something really forced and, like, you know, or that we have to come up with some type of action or event that, you know, kind of pops up and it has to be really big. Like, thank you all for coming, you know. Um, but there's there's inner work and there's interpersonal relationship work that you should do also, right? And a, a huge part of moving forward is seeing what am I willing to, like, how far am I willing to go, Right? in whatever it is that you're trying to do in moving forward in whatever movement is. How far am I willing to go? Where am I where am I where's my comfort level right now? Am I going to push past my comfort level? Because a lot of conversations around being bi are mainly conversations around gender, right? Like people want to talk about gender, they want to talk about sex, they want to talk about, you know, all these things and so um how uncomfortable am I willing to get? Right? Like in real life, how, you know, how truthful am I going to be in conversations? How transparent am I going to be in conversations? How trusting am I going to be with the, of the other person? Which is why I'm always like, we should start on a really interpersonal level instead of like this huge systemic level because there's a trust thing, right? I have to be able to trust somebody enough to tell them even what my gender pronouns are. Or, you know, if I feel uncomfortable when they say a particular type of thing, especially in a society where someone can go, oh, it's just my opinion, and it's fine after that, right? And, like, mm -hmm. we're supposed to erase our emotions and not feel anything because someone has an opinion. Um, so I feel like in moving forward, that's the biggest thing um, is our own interpersonal inner work, whether we're talking about this or any other subject. Yeah, so I very much agree with that. And I think another thing about moving forward is maybe kind of looking backwards to move forward. So I recently blogged about kind of thinking through the history of, I suppose, the gay movement in terms of where that came from, because it seemed like we had the Kinsey studies, you know, and that was all about starting to open this up, up this idea of diversity. There was this real spectrum of kind of sexual attraction you know there was a spectrum of sexual desire some people were asexual to having a high sexual desire some people more attracted to men all the way to being attracted to women and then even that started to get disentangled you know and maybe there's other aspects of sexuality and then it kind of all just seemed to get closed down into this this binary this gay straight um and it felt like there was this assumption that there's gay people and straight people and then wider culture was like, well, the gay people aren't as good as the straight people or they're, or they're actually sinful or they're actually ill or something. And then gay rights was kind of addressing that and trying to get that equality, but it wasn't addressing the first part of the assumption, which is there are these two categories of people, right? And I feel like we need to go back to that concept of gender and sexual diversity. So, in, and so it's not about just addressing the small minority maybe of people who are actually identifying maybe as bi pan fluid, but it's actually about addressing all the people whose, whose sexuality and gender don't fit neatly in those boxes. And the kind of research coming out at the moment seems to suggest that's at least about a third of people who don't completely fit into boxes of male and female and who don't completely fix, fit into boxes of gay and straight in terms their experience and their attractions 
And then there's also this other piece about how that shifts over time. And a lot of people, even if they do fit in their boxes, it may not be for all of the time. So I think the way to go is like, it's teaching gender and sexual diversity rather than teaching, you know, kind of heterosexuality and then a special little add-on session for LGBT, <laughs> you know, or LGBTQ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, go for it. No, I was, I was yeah, and I think um, the challenge um, oftentimes when a person comes out, or for me at least, was which box are you in? Which label do you identify? And I think that in our alphabet soup of a community, um, it, the, the pressure is to be uh, one or the other or to pick one. Um, and then also I think that the my experience in um, coming out as bisexual um, or talking about bisexuality is uh, a big question about like gender. Um, and then course um, the policing that happens in the queer communities um, there are certain set rules on what it means to be a lesbian or to be straight and then with bisexuals and what you don't have no rules <laughs> so then you know you have, you have so much more freedom and you're, you're less oppressed so um, I'm being sarcastic <laughs> so um, and I think that um, by you know, the concept of bisexuality or pan or fluid omni uh, really uh, allows us that freedom to, to say, hey, why are we uh, policing? What, what kind of rules are we setting on each other? And then, um, you know, when you get into relationships where gender isn't necessarily um, um, male or female, um, m man or woman. Um, so then there's that question. And I think that um, in the challenges of bisexual um, uh, progress, it correlates very closely to trans work and the question of um, sexuality is so different from gender and then, and then sex. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, the second question that I have, I know that some of you have touched on a little bit. Chong, I know you talked about um, uh, what it means to identify as being queer in Hmong communities and Meg talking about by recon in the UK. And I'm hoping that we can kind of expand a little bit on this next piece. Um, through your lived experiences, how have you seen bipan fluid and queer identities affected and or influenced by culture? Um, by culture, I mean race, class, ethnicity, things like that. <laughs> I know we just dove right into the heavy, right? <laughs> Start. Um, in my culture, being Hmong, um, gender is extremely important. Um, gender roles outline the kind of the life path that you're expected to live. Um, from a very young age, I was uh, taught that I would one day marry a man, and my whole sole purpose in life of being a woman is to service my husband and his family. Um, and that was at the end. So... <laughs> um, so I think that uh, gender roles play a huge part in the, the queer community. Also, as I kind of go back to the whole policing, um, although we have had huge steps in um, carving out space and, and um, a, a voice and visibility for gay and lesbian Hmong people, the bi community still is um, still, still working, still challenged. Um, as far as like, uh, gender and bisexuality, there's only two situations that I've heard of where it's been accepted. Um, the Hmong religion traditionally is uh, formerly known as shamanism, today um, known as animism. Um, and the belief is that your spirit is a gender. So if you um, are involved with the same-sex relationship, then you are disrupting the yin and yang, the, the, the natural balance in nature, and therefore can cause um, illness to yourself to, and to others, um, both mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So um, um, of what I've experienced, um, we did work with a shaman who was trans-identified um, and was identified as lesbian as well. So it was that was um, something very new. She was 70 years old, um, and that was something very different in our community. It was the first time in all of Hmong American history where um, an, a, an elder person came out and someone who was um, at a position of a shaman uh, to come out and identify as that. Um, another situation where a, trans, um, uh, a transgender person was accepted was um, born uh, male, um, identified as female, um, his parents 
conducted a number of shaman ceremonies, and every shaman that came through said, your son has the body of a, of a man, but um, has a spirit of a woman. And if you do not allow your child to um, uh, identify how they choose to, they will continue to be spiritually ill. So you need to embrace it. And so I, I think these two are very unique situations where um, it, it had to do with religion, um, and which is really interesting because for most of um, my experiences with shamanism, same-sex relationships or attraction is completely um, considered a sin. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question because I, I wrestle with this question or questions that are kind of similar to this question a lot as far as how has my culture and my community influenced queerness and how has queerness influenced my culture and community, right? Um, I feel like a lot of times we have very stereotypical uh, ways of seeing community, Right, like if I were to be up here and just talk about how black folks respond to me being bi, um, that's one thing. But that's really not my community, right? I'm a part of a community of artists. I'm a part of a community of hip hop. I'm a part of a community of um, really like intelligent black folks that you know um, hold their religion and their intelligence is the same thing. And in each one of these communities, I feel like a lot of times we don't necessarily understand how our community has influenced the way that movements in queer culture has have happened, right? So um perfect example, in almost any queer situation where there is a campaign, there's some type of hip hop or slang the slogan or ebonics type slogan um to capture the youth, right? Or to have the youth involved. And so that's like a hip hop influence. That's my culture influencing queer community without queer community giving any particular. And then the queer community will turn around and be like, oh, but hip hop's so homophobic. And they don't understand. And they're, you know, they're, they're really biphobic and they're every, every type of phobic. They're sexist, you know, every, all of it. Just, you know, run the gambit and have conversations about how hurtful um, my communities and, and what I identify as has been to the queer community. Um, instead of holding, like, understanding where exactly a lot of these things are stemming from and knowing that any systemic ism is not stemming from the people that are being oppressed by it, right? Um, but instead, I'm a part of a lot of conversations about why black folks are so homophobic and people expect me to come up and talk about how hard it is for me to be black and female and bi, um, when actually that's not the case. There's a lot of situations in which the um, the only, I guess, static or, or, or problematic situation is when I cannot prove what I'm speaking, right? So we have this, this saying that's kind of show and prove, right? If you are going to say this, you need to show us the math, you need to show the science, and you need to be able to prove it. And not, not a lot of people in queer spaces have done that, especially with my communities. And so my communities just don't take what they say as, you know, as any type of truth because you have not proved it. You have not taken the time to sit down and have these conversations and show and prove yourself, right? Um, I identify as Nuwabian, which means that I study ancient African religion, which is math and science, right? And so in math and science, if you cannot break something down mathematically, you can't break it down scientifically. If, you're, if you don't have the time to even have those conversations, then what you're saying is not relevant, right? And so where a lot of people would say, oh, that's really homophobic, um, like there's a lot of cats like Phil Valentine and, you know, Ray somebody, I don't remember all their names, um, who are very, like, anti-queerness, uh, but are very, like, pro, you know, education and knowledge around original black studies and Africanness. Um, part of that is because there has not been any particular bridge or any particular interest, or, and you know, there, there just hasn't been a lot of folks that have came up and been like, hey, I would like to know what you're on so you can know what I'm on. Um, and that's an intersectionality that's probably not going to happen for quite some time because that means we have to address race, which a lot of people in the room are probably not willing to address, right? We have to address um, things like slavery because, for me, a lot of the way that I identify gender and sexuality-wise has a lot to do with, like, forced breedings, and all types of other, like, you know, things that happened in my ancestors' past that we haven't had conversations around. Um, a lot of 
kind of the things that we talk about seem very like they're coming out of this really pure, really awesome place, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes there's a lot of sexual trauma and there's a lot of um, stuff that we're not uncovering within ourselves and conversations that we're not having and healing that we're not allowed to have and we're not really allowed to have spaces to do that healing for all types of reasons because we're women and trying to do it because we're black and trying to do it because we're queer and trying to do it you know there's all types of reasons for us not being able to have access to the things that we need to heal um but nonetheless we don't have access to it and so we're kind of stagnant in this place and i'm kind of stagnant in the middle of that question trying to figure out you know what <laughs> where have where's my you know my culture influenced my sexuality and where's my sexuality influenced my culture Does that make sense mm -hmm. okay <laughs> yeah, I, my brain is like going in 500 different directions, which I love it. I'm like, yes, yes, it totally makes sense. Because, and, and I think it's really, it's really complex, right? And I'm thinking about my own upbringing and kind of my experience. And um, I was brought up in Italy. I was brought up Catholic, you know, um, my, from my mom's side, uh, very strong Sicilian influence. My mom was born in Sicily. We went back to Sicily like every vacation. We're a very working class family. So all we did was pack everybody in the car, drive 12 hours, stay at the great aunt's house, and then drive back. That's all I did for 18 years. That was my vacation. Um, whether it was Christmas or whether it was the summer. And at the same time, there were all this like different influences because often when I talk about being brought up Catholic here or in kind of Anglo-American context, people have a totally different ideas and I was brought up in a Catholicism that was very much about very strong female role models through Mary and the saints, a lot of what I would call candle magic now as a neo-pagan, very strong pagan influence that was very palpable, you know, a lot of like black Madonna's culture as well that kind of really spoke to the kind of multi-cultural um, and multi-racial roots as well of Sicily. And um, so a lot of complexities around class and religion and like that's why my head is spinning in 500 different directions in terms of how did that impact my sexualities you know and 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 what is my relationship with that and um and a lot of kind of hidden uh, queer sexualities also because of that influence but at the same time a certain freedom that when i talk to people who are brought up in more kind of anglo-american context i don't think they had that freedom uh sometimes you know there was a lot of kind of freedom to develop really close uh, relationships for example with different people of all genders and that wasn't labeled straight away as queer and that gave me really a lot of freedom in some ways to kind of come to terms with my own identity but then there's there are just so many things that impact the the way I look at kind of my own experiences and my own sexualities you know the being you know emigrating and going to the UK when I was in my early 20s I remember the first time that I saw two women kiss on a street in London I was really that for me was a really defining moment to see kind of two people of the same gender um, openly expressing kind of a romantic sexual uh, kind of expression of affection I've never seen that and that opened up a lot of possibilities goes back to this opening and closing you know there was a lot of things started to make sense and then it took you know it's taken another 20 years to get to the point I mean now in terms of understanding my own gender and sexuality um, and I could talk more about how coming into you know um, queer community was really interesting and challenging because there was all this labeling that was happening so I first came out as bi um, in my 20s and I came across so much biphobia and I, and I was also coming out of kind of a violent uh, first marriage and, and we could talk about class and violence and gender and that's a whole other conversation um, and when I and I, I caught on straight away that there was a lot of gender policing that wasn't okay to be bi and it wasn't okay for me to express my gender and the way I was expressing it and there were other expectations and I kind of tried to conform to those expectations and then when I came eventually into bi community 15 years ago by accident because I started dating um, the, one of the people I'm still with and um, and going to Bicon for the first time, that's what then allowed me to also come into my trans identity. So where's that intersection of kind of communities that allow for broader expressions of uh, ways to be and to express your gender? And uh, was the first time they really started to know some more gender fluid and trans identified folks. And, but there were also 
other problems around uh, what it was like for me to be an Italian in a UK context where there's a lot of xenophobia even within Europe and not all white people are the same kind of white people, right? And I was definitely the wrong kind of white person in the UK in some ways and because of my ethnicity. And there was a lot of kind of, you know, I, a lot of perceptions I wasn't to be trusted because of being Italian and I was fiery and passionate and I was going to cheat on people and, uh, you know, all this. And th it was really, um, and then that was compounded when I came out as bi, definitely not to be trusted, right? We always knew you weren't one of us, you know, and, and, and then this kind of spiral and, and I could talk also about class and what it's like to come from a very working class background and being kind of first generation like, um, uh, sex as, female sex assigned a birth person to go to college and then get a PhD and, and now parenting a child who's in a totally different class from mine uh, and having a disability, like we could talk about that and how that's impacting, you know, my sexuality, having an invisible disability and what does it mean to negotiate that in terms of relationships, also in terms of community, what you show up for and what you don't show up for. I want to show up for everything, right? I want to show up for bi communities and I want to show up for trans communities and I want to show up for anti-racism work because it's really messed up in this country and the more I'm here, the more I'm like learning the deep ways in which it shapes all of my communities and kind of I want to do that. And I get exhausted because, you know, um, of my disabilities. And, and how, how does that shape me and how does that shape my relationship? And, you know, it's really complex. It's like, I don't know if I'm making any sense. I feel like, but I've been talking about the 500 directions in my head, so I'm going to like be quiet now. But it's, it's really com good questions, really complicated. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, you achieved that. <laughs> so, yeah, intersectionality. You know, I think it's been so helpful to hear three different, like, this is some of the threads, you know, and it's not even all of the threads, you know, like, we can follow each of those, each of those threads. And um, uh, when we wrote the bisexuality report, we looked at the San Francisco Bi Invisibility Report. I don't know if people are familiar with that. You know, that kind of preempted us, and that was a really good kind of report all about bisexual invisibility. Um, and when we wrote the bisexuality report, we were kind of like, we're just hearing this about intersectionality, so let's add a bit at the end. Let's add a piece about intersectionality. Just have a paragraph or so about, like, age, gender, geographical location, religion, disability, some other things. And I was kind of like, um, people said to us, kind of, it, it needs to be woven through it. You know, you can't even just... You know, that's not even enough. You need to kind of have it all the way through. And I, was, and I think that's it. And I think a lot of us are just even beginning to realize the threads in our own experience. Like, it's only been recently that I've been able to put things together about kind of my experience of class being really important in terms of my experience of gender. You know, so I was kind of from a mixed class background. I mean, you never hear people talk about mixed class, but when I heard sort of people talking about mixedness, that kind of made sense to me. And like, I got actually, you know, one side of my family is kind of upper class, like people who speak like the queen. And the other side, you know, the family were really working class. My, my granddad was a carpenter. Um, my grand worked in a factory. And it was kind of, okay. And then I went to a working class school and, and in that school, gender was really segregated. And I had that sense of not, not only not really fitting working class or upper middle class, but also not really fitting this line of boys or this line of girls. And I think loads of that laid the groundwork for me, for my, for my bisexuality, when that kind of, I'm like in the middle again. So there's, and there's some commonalities across those different experiences of mixedness, but there's also, you know, some important differences there as well. So, yeah, I think we just really need to think about intersectionality constantly and think, well, how does this impact on this person's experience? So, like, recently I was training people um, in London um, in workplaces about, about um, sort of training LGBT groups about bisexuality. I, a load of the, the, particularly the white people there, were kind of, everyone should be out about being bi. You know, that's how we get, move forward. No, why are there hardly any white, uh, out bi people in, in here? And, and why are the only out bi people white people? And, and then one black woman very bravely stood up and said, look, for me um, in this organization, if I come out as bi, I'm already hypersexualized as a black woman. And I'm just going to get sexual harassment day in, day out, because it's already bad enough. And again, that's not every black woman's experience or every black bi woman experience but it was her experience and so even a conversation about outness and self-disclosure at work needs to be to think about all those different strands for different people rather than just having this blanket 
everyone should be out. Um, or another thing is about community. So we're kind of like this idea, everyone should come to community events. And recently in the UK, we've been thinking a lot about class. And it's like, well, our buy spaces, you know, they're mostly at universities. Um, everybody that is geeky, everybody knows Doctor Who inside out, right? <laughs> but nobody watches soap operas or reality TV. Everybody's lefty, you know, loads of people are veggie, you know. And actually, when you come into that space, if you're not those things, you're kind of like, I don't fit in here. You know, I want to go and play football or I want to, you know, I watch these programs. That's what I want to talk about. And there's nowhere for me to do that. Here, or there's a you know, hundred workshops on like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you know sci-fi and fantasy, and there's hardly anything on you know other kind of genres, for example, and just little you know things like that that you don't even think about when you're in. That's the thing you don't think about it how it's going to be for everybody in that space. So we need different spaces, and we also need to be mindful when we're setting up spaces of who is this include and who is this exclude. Thank you so much for all of your thoughts. I'm just kind of in the space where I'm processing right now of the collective wisdom. And I just wanted to name that I'm so very grateful to have this experience to be sharing this with you all. So I'm really excited about that. Um, aw, I love you too. <laughs> um, so um, I think we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, and I have just a couple of things um, ahead of time. Anne, are you going to do the mic? You're okay with that? Okay, great. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, for the questions that you have, I'll probably ask one to two panelists, or well, I'm going to let you all self-choose. I'm not going to call you out um, <laughs> to answer the questions, just in an interest of trying to maximize how many we get answered for the rest of the time. Um, and I do want to point out, it's OK if um, you have a question and you're not sure about language use or how to frame it. Um, we are more than happy to help with that. I do want to add the caveat, though, that um, framing it in as respectful a way as possible um, to get the answer that you're seeking is what we're hoping for. Um, so if we gently have a teachable moment, um, please don't take offense to that. We're just trying to provide information for you and the rest of the audience. Um, and lastly, during this time, um, we will only be taking questions um, and not comments um, to make that distinction. Um, if you would like to comment or have a conversation with us, we'll be here after closing time um, to be able to do that. And again, that's just in an interest of trying to maximize as many questions as possible. Sound good? All right, part two. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start here and go through. Okay. Um, Hi. I was just, um, I know that bisexuality has been gaining a voice recently and that's been very important, but I feel that people who don't necessarily identify as bisexual, especially people who are like pansexual and fluid, those people receive a lot more stigmatism in the sense of like, oh, well, you're making it too complicated now, like you're just being greedy. And I know that a lot of people who identify as those tend to identify with other groups of people as bisexual just because it's easier to explain. Um, what do you think you can say about, for like, not necessarily advice, but just information for people who are either struggling with identifying as pan or fluid or any kind of thing that's a little bit above the spectrum of bisexuality or people who are trying to understand that as a concept? Um, I think the language is so fascinating and interesting, right? And I think that... Um, when I was when I was listening to you, I was like, "Oh, that's really interesting," because often bi folks are whatever you know. Bi is a big umbrella. I think about bi as like a, one of the um, potential umbrellas, or you know, uh, non monosexual, or more you know, omnisexual. There, there are lots of different uh, umbrellas. Um, often folks are kind of not in that binary of sexuality are accused of being greedy or complicating things. You know, I remember um, I'm a family therapist and I remember going to this training about sexuality and this person felt so proud that they had this really great model for uh, family development and identity development for lesbian and gay people. And then I was like, well, that doesn't fit me as a bi person. They were like, well, it depends on who you are in a relationship with. And I said, well, I'm a kind of an openly, ethically non-monogamous person, so that doesn't make sense either. And my gender is kind of complicated. And, you know, he looked at me and went, well, you know, you know that just complicates my model. And I'm sorry, that's just too difficult, you know. And I was like, well, then your model, it's kind of sucks because I cannot be in it, right? And so I really, you know, I hear you when you say that because I think that, and it's interesting about who gets, you know, I always think about, let's pay attention to, 
who is saying those things. So I'm always curious about, I would really like to know how you situate your identities, for example, when some, some people start saying those things, because often it, it is not, fo it, often it is folks in monosexual communities that thinks that like pansexuals or omnisexuals or people who maybe have kind of broader labels are like really complex. My experience personally in bi community, especially in bi UK community, I still feel like, you know, six years, I'm still kind of building relationship with bi community here is that actually people had a lot of labels. Like when we started collecting some data about bicon attendees, we had like a lot of folks, uh, you know, identified all over the place. You know, sometimes people talk about bi plus or, pan or bi pan fluid communities, whatever I want to call it. I think that when, when people start saying you're just making life too difficult, it's like, well, they're getting uncomfortable. It's something you were saying earlier about this is about their inner work, I think. And some was like, well, doesn't feel really complex to me. Like, I'm sorry it feels like that to you. Um, here are some resources. I would love for you to go and do some work on, on yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's like a lot of cis folks that accuse like bi to be really binary. And I'm like, well, you know, gay and lesbian kind of implies a binary too. And as a trans identified gender queer person who identifies bi, like I really don't need my cis allies to tell me that I'm wrong in my identity. And so, you know, it's kind of, so, uh, you know, how do we challenge people in a way that they can hear it, but also in a way that puts the bucket firmly back with them? Like, this is something you find difficult. Yeah. There's nothing, like, so out of this world about my experience, you know, and it's like, and I think a lot of bi folks, you know, it, it is a complex sexuality, right? People assume you're, you're a, attracted to everybody. I'm like, well, not really. <laughs> Actually, it was like, I mean, sometimes, but not really. <laughs> not most of the time, right? You're promiscuous. What well, kind of, but not really. <laughs> You know, and also what's wrong with being promiscuous, right? It, it's complicated. Um, so, I don't know. I could go on for a long time on this, so I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, I would have to say I, I was very challenged with labels as well. Um, and I think that um, how the bi community has uh, carved out space in the LGBTQ uh, community is also going to be similar to the experience of pan, fluid, omni as well. And I think that if you're brave enough, if people are brave enough to just name it, to identify as it, to call it out, I think that there's power in standing up and saying, hi, my name is Chong and I am bisexual. I think there is po power in that. And I think that if we continue to give ourselves permission to identify however we choose, then we are in a sense giving others permission to do the same. Right. <laughs> so we talk about like um, feeling policed, and, um, and and like I've heard about like the uh, um, the scientific studies they do, where they like put probes on people's bodies to prove that they exist and whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, and what I want to know is like, when when does the bi community stop? being the object of people's misconceptions and start being the subject of our own culture? That's a great question. <laughs> so I don't know if everyone's familiar with these studies about trying to prove whether bi men exist or not. No? Is everybody? I don't want to... Oh, no, I'll tell you a bit about it. Fun. Yeah, I'm going to explain it for fun because it is fun. Um, <laughs> So this was a f how many years back? Five, six years back that they did the first study, um, and they got they got guys in a room who identified as either straight or bi or gay, um, and then they used the penile placethmograph, um, <laughs> which was an instrument to tell how aroused the the men's penises became um, when they were looking at porn. The porn either had two women together being sexual or two men together being sexual, and they assumed that these guys, if they were turned on by the two men together, that meant they were gay. They were turned on by two women together, that meant they were straight. Mm -hmm. And if they were turned on by both, that meant they were bi. So like 30% of the people showed no, 30% showed no response to either of the videos. So they were just jettisoned from the data. <laughs> 
the remaining, <laughs> um, the remaining, the study did some very intense statistics, which I'd never seen in any other study before, and seemed to set, seemed to be saying, okay, all the rest of the guys were either they were turned on by the one video or the other video. No questioning of, you know, actually, if we'd put women in that study, would we say that they were straight on the basis they were turned on by a video of two men having sex? I'm not sure. Anyway, a um, lot of design flaws, but that was the basis of the New York Times headline that gay, straight, or lying, right? And the serious side of it is given what Alex said about the, we know the mental health problems of, of bi people or bi pan fluid people are higher, much higher than even heterosexual or lesbian and gay. You know, I just wonder how many people that had a terrible effect on that kind of erasure of that study. Anyway, last year we heard at the Bi Recon event that they'd redone this study and found that bisexual men do exist. So, sure. yay! Hooray. Thank you! <laughs> Thank you for saving us and coming and doing that research and proving that we exist after all. I just wanted to provide some background for anyone who didn't know what you were alluding to in that excellent question, because it really is. And yeah, exactly. I mean, when, we, when a group of us put together these uh, guidelines for people researching bisexuality, this was exactly our point of thinking behind it. It's like, it should not be about outsider coming in, studying these strange people and trying to explain it. It should be about what, you know, that is a wealth of expertise in, in bi, pan, fluid communities about a whole different way of understanding sexuality and gender and, um, and many other things actually when you take that kind of non-binary approach and that fluid approach to things like how we relate to others and how we think and how we experience our emotions it's all really quite valuable so instead I think it should be about like, what can our communities offer to the rest of the world in terms of another way of thinking about these things and doing these things that might be beneficial to everybody that's the way to look at it Can we have another question down? I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about kind of what you see as the implication for relationships, things like romance. Um, maybe I get at this as a thought experiment. Imagine we're 100 years in the future in a society that this diversity is just accepted. The phobia is everything is gone, and we can only hope. If I walk up and down the street and look at and talk to my neighbors, am I still going to see this very binary Pairing, because we tend to see romanticism as pairing, whether it's gay or straight, it's about pairing. Am I going to still see two men, two women, a man and a woman raising kids? Are we going to see in a hundred years of diversity, except are we going to see radically different forms, models, paradigms of relationships at that point? I'm just going to add one, as, uh, one comment real quick, is that I think that the poly community is growing and it's on fire. So as uh, somebody uh, who I think confused, uh, definitely confused the like uh, anti-marriage uh, equality people, I was like, I don't think you had my family in mind um, when uh, when you talked about one man, one woman, you know, and some kids. Um, you know, I think that those multi gender, multi-orientation, multi-pattern families have always existed. I don't think we need to wait for 100 years in the future. I think it's what you see. Like when I look around my community, I don't just see uh, like gay or lesbian or straight folks having relationships, and I definitely don't just see couples. I see all sorts of people bringing up children or relating to each other or mentoring each other or being family um, in a multitude of ways, and that's how a lot of our children have been brought up for across the globe and across the centuries, like everywhere. I think that actually the model of like uh, heteronormativity and the nuclear family, it's relatively uh, young, um, and that the dominant culture has done a really great, great job to make it the dominant model. So if I think about um, my own personal experience, for example, being somebody who's like a trans-masculine trans -masculine identified, whose main partner, um, you know, of almost 15 years is a cis male, and we have a child, and we're both the biological parents, and we've been in an openly non-monogamous relationship for 15 years, and at times there have been other kind of really significant partners, and also there are other significant adults. They are not our partners, who are our family of choice, and the people who are there that would take care of our child if something happened to us, or who take care of our child in lots of different ways. It's... I think for a lot of us, it's already more complicated. Um, and I, I think that it's just um, fear 
in some ways that we don't want to see that actually there are already a lot of different models of relationships and families. There are lots of mixed orientation um, partnership configurations. The people that have been bringing up kids in quads and poly communes for like 30, 40 years and more, in, and also like, you know, the monogamous marriage is, is the norm in only s small parts of the globe, not everywhere, and definitely historically hasn't been the only form of doing relationships and doing family. So I think it's actually, if we know more of our history, we don't even need to look ahead. We just need to kind of take the, um, the narrow um, view off and start learning more about uh, global history and, and our history as a humanity to really realize how complex sexuality really is. It goes back to this idea, actually, there is gender and sexual diversity and partnership you know, diversity in terms of relationship. This idea of romantic love and monogamy and nuclear family is it's very recent, um, and, it, and it obviously doesn't work very well for a lot of people. It works for some people, but not for everybody. So. <laughs> Another question? Next to Jason, Anne. Uh, okay. Um, so there's been, from some people in the PAN community, there's been some uh, comments about um, binarism within the definition of bisexuality, which as a non-binary person who also identifies as bisexual, I think that's not entirely true, and also kind of unfortunate because I think that bi and pan people should be trying to support each other. Um, but like, what kind of advice would you have or, or comments would you be able to make about statements like that? Well, as another non-binary non bi person, I like Shiri Eisner's definition of bi, which is to use the bi to mean attraction to people as the same gender and attraction to people of other genders to me, although I do kind of wonder what people of the same gender as me exactly would look like. <laughs> but it goes back to the question we had over there as well, isn't it? It's just all kind of exploding out. You know, we have 50, 58 genders on Facebook now to choose from, and there's so, so many more than, than that. And like you said, Alex, about the relationship diversity, globally and just how massively diverse that is. I, yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? There's this kind of tendency to to go in off into, yeah, everyone has a completely, with intersectionality, everyone has a unique gender, unique sexuality, unique set of experiences. So the how you end up is completely different, you know, to everybody else. But also there's some sense in which we need to organize around, yeah, those of us who are questioning the binaries of gender and sexuality. It does kind of make sense for us to club together a bit and kind of say, hey, we're here, you know. So, so yeah, I think... For me, that, that understanding of the bi in bisexual coin of means that that can be quite a useful umbrella term, but also we need to be very respectful of the fact that it may not be a term that works for everybody, um, but ask for the same respect in response of like, yeah, if I am choosing it, then, you know, I'm not doing it to be, to be a real binary <laughs> kind of <laughs> imposing person. Hey, any other questions? Yeah, over here. Hi. Um, so I am wondering um, when we start, to, when we talk to people who are new to these kind of conversations, we're talking about orientation and expression and gender. How do we um, combat the over sexualization and the hyper -sexual sexualization of these conversations when sexuality is such an important part of these conversations? Because I see, like, I have a friend who came out as bi, and the response from the public was very sexual. And it was really disheartening. So, Sol or Chong, would either of you care to tackle this one? I'd love to hear some more of your wisdom. That's tough. When I first came out as bi, um, half of my lady friends stopped talking to me. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe they were just nervous or maybe they just didn't know how to react. I don't know. But um, uh, half of my guy friends, they were okay with me, but they wouldn't let me hang out with their girlfriends or wives. 
um, they were afraid I was going to recruit them to the other side. I'm like, we have cookies on the other side. <laughs> but, um, and then I had other friends who kind of came around after a while and they're like, hey, can I watch? And I was like, no, you cannot. Um, I think that oftentimes uh, when we talk about sexuality, it's hard to take the sexualization out of it because then people ask, well, how do you have sex? And um, if you are in a poly relationship, how does that work? Does that make all parties part of the relationship? Um, and I think that um, I think it's based on how comfortable you are in talking to the person and how open you're willing to share. Um, depends on the the person that has asked me these questions. I'll just frank be frank with them and um, say what's on my mind. Otherwise. Um, I've straight out had to say, what does my sex life have anything to do with you? Or um, um, tell me why you feel my sex life is any of your business. You know, um, And a big part of coming out does not mean I'm coming on to someone. So that's something that I share too. Um, and I think that was kind of the fear uh, with some of my close friends that I lost along the way was they felt that my coming out meant that I was somehow going to be attracted to them or was attracted to them or somehow trying to hit on them. So I think it's very clear to draw that line. I honestly don't have an answer <laughs> to your question. Um, but, you know, I feel like it's a part of it is just figuring out what makes you more comfortable, what you want to rock with and how you respond to certain situations. And like, have conversations with other people about how they're going to respond in certain situations. And whatever feels good to you, whatever is comfortable to you, kind of rock with that, right? Some people are a lot more forward, you know, like Chong is like, it's none of your business. Back up. Some people will take the, you know, like whatever weird sexual comment will laugh to get the co to get through the conversation to like get somewhere. And some people just get really uncomfortable, you know what I'm saying? And, and they don't, and they want to back out of it as quickly as possible. I don't think any, um, Choice is a particularly wrong choice. It's just whichever one makes you feel comfortable, and that's like how the universe balances itself. We all do different things and handle situations differently. I know it's a really cliche answer, but I haven't, you know, took time to think about it. Did anybody else care to respond? Alex, did you want to? Yeah, try to keep it brief. No, it's coming. Kind of, you're you go right ahead. Um, I think it's interesting how people like thing that can really hypersexualize or be really inquisitive about people's bodies and relationships if they're not uh, cisgender or heteronormative. And I think that that really happens a lot in terms of um, in, in our society. And, and one way sometimes I address it is kind of by turning the tables and going, oh, when, when you come out as a straight, like, did, did a lot of people get worried that you were hitting on them when you told them you were straight? And they're like, I, I don't know what you mean. I'm like, well, you know, like, and how did, like, how did you find out? And did you lose any friends? And, and then it, the, the penny starts to drop that this is not okay. Because I think often, we are so used to kind of heteronormativity and cisgenderism that we take it for granted that people get to question our bodies and our relationships, and we kind of go along with it, right? And and often that sometimes happens even with trans young people, you know, and like parents be really interested in like, do you want to have surgeries and what surgeries? And, and I'm like, how would you feel if we started to talk about your junk? And, you know, the parents are like, what do you mean? I'm like, Let's think about that for a minute. Or, you know, when, or when children come out and parents are like, I can't think about you having sex with, like, you know, an, another girl or another guy. And I'm like, why are you thinking about your kids having sex? <laughs> Let's talk about that. You know, so when you shift the focus and it's a kind of, you know, really, for me, it's about let's unveil the underlining assumption here. Um, and often that, you know, so if we talk about sexuality, we're talking about sex, which is something we're not used to doing in our society. Um, and so let's talk about everybody's sex life. So let's talk about everybody's junk, you know, if that's a conversation we're having. And of course, people don't want to talk about their junk by and large. And if they do, then it's a really interesting conversation to navigate. <laughs> Other questions? How can, some, how can someone answer the question uh, that people ask? And it's more, it's more like a suggestion, but it's, it's said as a question. Well, if you're bisexual 
and you're saying that your wife can't meet certain needs that you have. Is that any different than a man that says, oh, my wife can't meet all my needs because I have a bigger sex drive than she. I'm bisexual. My wife is straight, and she understands that there are some things that she just cannot um, fulfill, and she's okay with that, and she accepts that, that people say to her, well, I don't have anything wrong with Joe being bisexual, but he'll have to be monogamous. And she says, well, that's not going to happen. So uh, is there an answer to people like that? Well, I think it speaks to a bigger conversation that we need to be having. So one of the projects I've been involved with lately is uh, analyzing sex advice. Um, so I've looked at like 60 sex advice books over the last few months, which was not pleasurable uh, <laughs> at all. <laughs> and a lot of websites I've looked at, a lot of newspaper problem pages, agony aunt columns, that kind of thing. And, and a lot of them seem to assume that people need to have, like people who are in relationships need to have exactly the same kind of sexual compatibility, right? There shouldn't be any discrepancy. They should fulfill all of each other's sexual needs. And a lot of the sex advice books are about, ooh, actually, people are really struggling with that, aren't they? But the kind of answers they give are really, are really simplistic and actually quite patronizing answers. So they're just like, okay, we're going to give you all these positions, right? Have you seen those books? You know, we're just going to say, here's 50 different positions in which to do the exact same thing, just like standing <laughs> on your head, but the exact same thing. <laughs> you know? And that's the answer. And that's not the answer. No one, no one has resolved their sexual differences by just doing lots of different positions, I think. Uh, but but it's because they're stuck in a very limited kind of constrained version of, of what counts as a relationship and what counts as sex. You know. So yeah, I think what we need to be putting out there is actually any relationship you have is going to have discrepancies in. And any sexual relationship you get have is going to have sexual discrepancies. You're going to have some different desires. Now it's up to each individual relationship of how you're going to navigate that. You know, and, and some people, for some people, some form of open mon non-monogamy is the way. And sometimes that's about saying, well, this very, this very one thing that I really can't do, I can't, you know, it's, most people can't maybe be a, a whole different gender for their partner than the one that they are. So that, you know, then non-monogamy comes on the table and maybe it's within a certain restriction or maybe it's wide open non-monogamy there's all different versions of non-monogamy but there's also all kinds of other things that we need to be thinking about like you know what to what extent you know sexual fantasies come in and role play and what you know to what extent people can be having cyber sex you know now that we've got technology in the picture but the, but the sex advice i've been reading it just constrains it all it says well first of all you must be having sex it's not okay to not be having sex in a relationship so right there we have people doing really non-consensual stuff Stuff because they're forcing their bodies to have sex because they feel like I must keep doing this otherwise I'm going to lose the relationship you know we need to get rid of that we need to say it's fine to not have sex in a relationship you know as long as people can find some ways of getting their sexual desires met it doesn't have to be that you meet everything right here with this person in a specific way and also it defines sex so narrowly you know it's only like penis and vagina intercourse really in these books that's defined as sex rather than the whole spectrum of things people can be doing and also it enforces a certain kind of monogamy and says, like, you've got to be doing that, nothing else is okay. We need to kind of open it up so people can start having these conversations like, like you've had, obviously, and find their own way through it. And then we've got to respect people's choices of how they have found their way through it, because this is difficult stuff for everyone. This is not just about bisexuality. That kind of discrepancy in relationship thing is, is difficult for everybody, I think. Other questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, the book I wrote already on relationships, rewriting the rules, kind of covers some of this stuff. But I'm also writing a sex advice book next year. And Alex and I just plan to write a book together about relationships as well. So there are many books to come. <laughs> I thought I saw another hand go up on the side. No? Any other questions? Well, I have one. Sure. And I have the microphone, so I guess that works. Um, so as someone who's done a lot of activism and came out in 1980 as a lesbian when we didn't, we didn't talk about bi and trans stuff and it, it was a really different kind of queer world and we didn't call it that either. But, um, <laughs> you know, and now uh, fast forward and I'm legally married, which I never thought would happen. Uh, and I'm thinking... 
So we've, we have gained a lot around public policy, whether it's same-sex marriage or don't ask, don't tell, or things like that. Um, very much, I would argue, on the, on the idea that, for example, my lesbianism is not something I can control. It's like being left-handed and poor Anne or twin sister straight. She's a lesbian. She didn't, you know, she didn't choose this, so we can't discriminate against her. So I'm curious about, you know, if anybody's willing to kind of talk about the political implications of what to me is really true, which is this wonderful, vast, messy, complicated, beautiful view of gender and sexuality that's kind of politically a nightmare, right? If you think about arguing for rights, it's challenging. Maybe not a nightmare, but it's challenging. And so, I, and so I'm curious about that and also curious about just what biphobia from gay and lesbian folks looks like because I really think gay and lesbian folks need to take it seriously and it's a huge problem. And I think maybe it looks a little different than w from other folks. And I know that's more comments but questions, but hopefully I get a pass. Thanks. <laughs> It? Yeah. Yeah, well, so let's just start with the, what's it like to, to hang out with gay and lesbian folks and what is that, I mean, is it, is it getting better? What does it look like? What would you want if you, you know, had the ear of every person who identified as gay or lesbian, like as I do, what would you want us to know? Well, that was part of it. <laughs> that was, that was, that was part the second two. Part. Yeah. But I also have... That there's a whole political part too. <laughs> so the political part um, is 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 confusing because I think when I first started organizing in the API community around the marriage amendment, um, a lot of people looked at me and thought I was crazy because um, in the monk community, uh, cultural weddings are what is recognized, not a piece of paper, nothing at um, city hall. Um, so what was happening on the steps of the Capitol didn't matter to majority of my community. So the quick, great conversation then was how would marriage look like if it was same sex in our community? Because there's a dowry, a $5,000 head price for the bride, so then which family pays for who and the who loses the last name, who then belongs to which clan? So that was kind of the bigger question. Um, so politically, I mean, in my own opinion, um, I have my own views on marriage and as an institution, but I, I am not a fan of having any institution legalize my relationships. That's just my personal opinion. Um, the second part, I'll have to think about the second part of the question. Um, so, yeah, I can kind of touch on the whole uh, situation of like, oh, you can't help that you're queer. This is, you know, um, it's very interesting because I feel like, to be honest, to be 100% honest, queer people kind of put ourselves in this situation where um, we wanted to be in the political field, right? This wasn't a thing. We could care less, right? Like in, in, in a very not long time ago, I probably wasn't alive, but I know that this was the thought. It was kind of like, you know, forget or, or bump what you think to be, you know, marriage, right? Bump your pieces of paper. We don't care. The whole point of us throwing this glitter in the air is to be weird anyway, right? Like, it's to show everyone we're done with this. We're going to color our hair and, you know, do, do all, types of, all types of things to show society that we don't want to go by those rules, right? Um, and then there is this kind of, like, calming process that happened to women, queers, and black folks all at the same time where it was like, we'll be in a bunch of jobs, we'll be in academia, and we can do this in a very uh, calm, well-mannered, politically correct way. Um, and some people, mainly folks in Minnesota, think that that's amazing and that's great, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> we love our passive aggressiveness, you know? <laughs> We love it, and I feel like that was something that we did. Um, I, w I don't want to say we, because uh, I, I I do hold very separate um, ideas of of white queerness and and brown queerness, right? So um, I'm going to say y'all for the fact that y'all is a majority in the room. A lot of y'all decided we're going to politicize this cause. We're going to make ourselves into this political cause, and left straight people to define 
what that outer narrative looks like, right? And a lot of us in the black community kind of watched and we're like, oh, okay, um, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, you know, there, there were folks involved, but like I said, there's a, there's a very clear uh, separation between being queer in, in black culture because you're black and you're dealing with a lot of other things that kind of have to do more with your race than your sexual identity and your sexual orientation, right? Like, I'm not going to get into an argument with a cop because I'm bi. I'm going to get into an argument with a cop because I'm black, right? Like, that's, you know, um, and so was, there's a lot of me watching what white communities did with the whole political, um, the way they allowed themselves to kind of get politicized and then, like, allowed other people to kind of use that in a whole bunch of other narratives for their causes, right? And there was really no affirmation. There was really no... Um, uh, unity or no declaration of what this means for us. Like, yes, this can mean something on paper, but there was really no, like, um, no, no way, no form of tradition or anything to, to counter that. So we, we kind of, like, allowed ourselves to get pushed into this really, you know, oh, you can't help it that you're, you're queer. So let's just be okay with you getting married. Let's just be, you know, like, like that can, that, that's something that people can vote on. Like, no one can vote on someone else being okay with who and how you are. Um, and so I think that going back to systems where we say F it and we're not going to participate at all because that's what it's all about, right? To fight any ism, we just have to say, forget this ism, forget the system that supports it. We're not going to support it at all. We're not going to participate in it. We're not going to, you know, pay for a marriage license or whatever. Um, you know, we're not going to feed the city that discriminates against us. And instead of that, we kind of just slid towards home on the political department, didn't really strategize. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're quite right that there's a real tension in, in kind of lesbian, gay, bisexual, lesbian, gay, and bisexual kind of communities around this very issue of, and it's what I was saying at the beginning, really, about how the whole movement started with this kind of, okay, there's gay and straight, and we want to prove that gay are as good as straight, and kind of a lot of that got done on that born this way, it's natural, you know, looking for for the brain of the gay person kind of kind of discourse, right? And and yeah, and it just didn't get into that other part of actually there's diversity and actually sexuality, gender, all these things are biopsychosocial. That's the word I like to use. There's obviously some biology there. There's obviously some psychology there, and there's obviously a whole dump of social stuff there. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have completely different ways of understanding sexuality and gender across the globe. And it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be about how you treat someone right because they can prove it's in their brain or their hormones or whatever. It should be about you treat everyone right no matter what. You know, that, that shouldn't matter. So I guess there is a real need, and it's a bit of a similar thing with the tension around feminism and trans as well. There's a need for a shift towards you've got to treat everybody right rather than this kind of, okay, we need to kind of prove these things biologically and then we can treat some people right on the basis of their biological proof, but the people who don't, who can't quite prove their brain is that way or whatever, they don't get treated as well. You know, the, we can't buy into that, I think, is, the, is my answer. Yeah, that's really interesting because there's so much about respectability politics, but also about fear and domination and power. You know, there's something that happened a lot of this, especially, you know, the history of many countries and the history of this country is definitely really violent and, you know, and there's, um, and things taken by force, whether it's the land taken by force, you know, from indigenous people or people taken by force, you know, from Africa to come in and be here and take over more land. And so, and, and it's interesting how we keep buying into it. And I think as queer people, we have been co-opted into respectability politics. And, and when you are, then you have to fear other people. So who becomes the other, right? So if those are the good gay citizens over here, you know, the good gay and lesbian citizens, who becomes the other, who becomes the freak, who becomes the people to fear. And those lines are for always shifting, right? It's fascinating, like, think about the marriage equality debate. Some of the arguments I was hearing community were just wild, going back to the idea of like, you know, communities of color being really uh, homophobic, you know, well, if we're going to lose the vote, it's going to be like California, you know, it's going to be those black people bringing us down, you know, I hear a lot of white folks say at the time, and I was like, okay, let's do some mafia, we're an 8% minority state, I think it's going to be the good white folks of Stillwater, you know, no offense, but you know, <laughs> they gave us Michelle Bachman that I'm more worried about than like my neighbors in Powderhorn, um, you know, and that would seem to be quite fine. Um, 
And so I think it's, you know, we really need to think about who do we feel comfortable with and who do we fear and who are we being told to fear and feel comfortable with? Who are we being told these are our people, these are not your people? This, you know, like come over here because there, there is a certain lure, right, to having this idea of rights. And so when we go into the... Um, you know, well, like you said, you know, poor, you know, like, of course you were born this way. It's okay. Well, what if we weren't born this way? You know, if saying that it's assuming that there is a rightness to heterosexuality, uh, same as that we assume that there is a rightness to cisgenderism in a lot of ways that we look at kind of trans folks' ex experiences or queer folks' experiences. And that to me is really scary because we've been there before in history over and over again. Who gets to be human and who gets doesn't get to be human. I mean, we've seen it with race, we've seen it with disability, you know, babies who were born with disabilities being thrown off like the mountains, you know, of Sparta. Like, we go through it as humans again and again. Who gets to be a valid human and who doesn't get to be a valid human? And that always scares me when, like, who gets to, you know, draw those lines. And, and I think there's definitely biphobia in gay and lesbian communities, and I could tell you stories. And they hurt, and instead of telling you stories, I'll tell you why They've hurt me and they keep hurting me when people don't see my identity. And also why I choose the label of bi rather than queer. Because when I say queer, people are making assumptions. And then one of my partners will come along and they're like, I thought you were queer. And I was like, I am. And, and people are making so many assumptions about my gender and who I have sex with. Um, and that's hurtful when it comes from my people. Because I want to feel like that queer folks are the folks who get the F you... I'm going to be me, like we are sexual revolutionaries, right? We don't care about your rules, but no, we really do. And actually, all of a sudden, you're other and you're outside. And, and that hurts because we're humans and we want to belong. Nobody likes to be outside. I don't like to be outside. And yeah, we keep doing it to each other in this really painful ways. And it hurts more when it comes from people who I thought got it in some way, shape, or form. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have about five minutes left, so if there's maybe one more question that we can... I'll just answer the part two real quick. Sure. Um, I think if I had a message for other gays and lesbians, it would be to truly be inclusive. I've been in places that were identified as LGBTQ, and it was not very uh, B or very even T inclusive. So I think that's a question that we still need to, a conversation that we still need to challenge our local organizations, um, and people that we work with, groups that we are a part of, um, to continually push for that, um, and not just to be invited to the, to the table, but to be part of building the table. Um, and then I can't remember the last part I was going to think of. Um, but yeah, I think that um, talking about Solar's co comment with the marriage amendment, um, I did some phone banking where I was asked not to identify as a true bisexual um, because I would have conversations and the person on the line would ask, well, how do you identify? And then I could not say that I was bisexual because that would confuse the person that we were talking about. I couldn't use the word queer either. Um, and so to have been void from um, being who I was, to identify who I was uh, during the, the campaign was a challenge. One last question. I think maybe I'll add just a little bit to um, Chong's comment if I could. Um, I think that um, something from my own experience and that what I continuously keep hearing is um, the idea of legitimizing um, bi pan fluid identities and um, how that really formulated how I look at my own identity and being able to actually verbalize that I identify as pan took a really long time to be able to do. And even how that works um, where I identify as pan and not as pansexual because the suffix connotes who it is that I'm sleeping with. And so removing that and being so meticulous with language, right? And the idea that um, Alex, something that you mentioned about like reframing how it is that we're having some of these conversations or the way that we're looking at them um, with when I think about like legitimate identities, if I tell somebody that I'm a pan female who's queer, that is not the responsibility of this person that I'm talking to or of anybody else to negate that um, because that's not something that I would do in, to their identity set. If somebody tells me, oh, I'm a cisgender male and I'm a father, I'm not going to say, no, I don't know if that kid's yours. 
Like, you know, like, it, there's, I, that, that kind of conversation wouldn't happen. So the idea of, like, reframing and the importance of that and of being able to claim your own identity, I think that there's a lot of power in that. Um, I think I'm going to maybe end there instead of keep going. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, again, I just wanted to um, express deep thanks to our panelists. I know that I've learned a lot, and I'm very, very grateful to have had this experience to share with you all. Thank you. I know that we have um, a couple of snacks left on the table, so please feel free. Um, all of us will be up here um, for a good maybe like I don't know, 10, 15 minutes longer um, if you have any questions or comments for us privately. So again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.